Representative Joe Zullo. I represent the 99th Assembly District, which encompasses just about 80% of the great town of East Haven, Connecticut. I'd like to welcome you all to another legislative forum on 2020 zoning initiatives. Uh, I am co-hosting this event tonight with Senator Tony Wong. He is tied up in another matter and he will be joining us momentarily. So I'll be doing most of the heavy lifting to get us started. Uh, as we kick off, I'd like to introduce uh, a number of legislators who have decided and uh, generously uh, decided to come on tonight and lend us their expertise and their time to weigh in on these matters. Uh, this evening, we have Representative uh, Paletta, uh, Joe Paletta, Representative Cindy Harrison, Senator Eric Berthel, Representative Rosa Rabimbis, Representative Tony D'Amelio, who will be late but should be able to log on, and Representative Dave Labriola. And we, before we begin, I would like to actually give each of them about 30 seconds just to introduce themselves, uh, explain where they represent, and uh, then we can get to move on. So starting with Representative Paletta. Uh, good evening, uh, Representative Zulo, and uh, to all the panelists and those of you joining on this call. Um, I'm Joe Paletta. I represent the towns of Watertown, Oakville, and Woodbury, the 68th House District um, here in the General Assembly. I'm also the ranking member on the housing uh, committee, which uh, has actually had an intricate part, um, while maybe not as large as the planning and development um, committee, but it has had um, a public hearing and some discussion around um, this issue. This is a very important issue. Local zoning should remain local. That's why we have our zoning boards and that's why we have um, our local zoning officers uh, to control what comes into our town. Um, we need to be very careful about the laws that we pass in Hartford. We all agree um, that housing is a right and that everyone should have a right to affordable housing. Um, the issue becomes what strains are put on the smaller towns. For instance, in Watertown, um, we do not have the capacity to build hundreds of units um, with perhaps two or three uh, kids each uh, attending the school system that would overburden the school system. Our public safety is already at bare bones. Um, our fire department is volunteer, so that would put an additional strain on them. Um, and perhaps we don't have the proper bus routes in different areas where we have open land. So I'm sure many of you will speak to this this evening and uh, bring up some very valid points. I'm all ears. Um, I will be jumping off in a little while, but um, for the meantime, I'm here. Uh, and I thank you, uh, Representative Zulo and Senator Wong, for the good work that you're doing uh, in bringing some awareness around this issue so people understand, like other issues, like the tolls uh, issue and others, and the no tax increase issues we've had in the past, that this is right up there. This is a very important issue in this session that we need to pay attention to. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you, Representative Paletta. And Senator Berthel, you, you can know that you can already see that I don't had a lot of meetings. Usually it would be, it would be customary to give uh, deference to the Senator in attendance, and I apologize for that. And so if you can, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, Representative, no harm, no foul. Uh, we're all in this together, but uh, I thank you for, for that. And uh, don't ever feel that I have to go first. Um, it's always good to follow my, my good friend, Joe Paletta. Um, who uh, I share representing the great town of Watertown with, as well as nine other towns in the 32nd Senate District. And I would say that, uh, first of all, I'd like to also acknowledge and thank our staff uh, from the Senate Republican Office and the House Republican Office for uh, helping to uh, actually make this all work tonight using all this technology that we've uh, been forced to become more comfortable with over the last year. And Representative Zulo, thank you, and to Senator Huang, who has not yet joined us for uh, continuing the, the you know, I, I don't want to call it a crusade, but it seems that way with you guys in terms of getting the word out and getting, uh, getting people informed on what is potentially, what potentially could happen with, uh, with this legislation. Um, this is, as uh, Representative Pletta spoke to, is actually a, a very dangerous piece of legislation, I, I believe. Um, we have seen, I would say, just as much uh, email and correspondence and telephone calls into the office on this bill as we have on things like the, uh, the mansion tax that's been floated out. And of course, the, the bill that, that just passed last week and was signed by the governor on the uh, religious exemption piece. All bills that are very high 
optics right now that are causing quite a bit of, uh, uh, of uh, concern and, and angst amongst uh, the people. And uh, it's good that we're here to have these forums. Uh, everyone is welcome, whether you agree with this or you disagree with what we're doing and what the message is, um, and whether you disagree or agree with how we feel about this as legislators. Uh, everyone is welcome to this forum and we look forward to hearing your comments. Uh, I do have to jump off at some point uh, due to a commitment uh, here in the district along with Representative Paletta, but uh, for the moment we'll hang and hang in and, and hear what you have to say. So thank you representative for uh, the opportunity to introduce myself. And I'm sorry, and uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, moving on quickly, Representative Harrison. Uh, good evening. I really want to thank Representative Zulo and Senator Wong for uh, putting this together and informing everyone. It's a big issue. Um, Representative uh, Labriola and I dealt with it in transportation. Um, and I know that in my district, 69, which is uh, Bridgewater, Roxbury, Southbury, and Washington, it's something they're very concerned about. And they feel that maintaining uh, local control of their planning and zoning is very important to them. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say and what you can educate the rest of our constituents on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And since you mentioned him, we'll move right on to uh, Representative Labriola. Thank you, Joe. Good to be with you all tonight. I uh, appreciate everybody who uh, is not only tuning in, but the people who put this together. Um, I'm Dave Labriol. I represent Oxford and parts of Naugatuck and Southbury uh, in the General Assembly. I, too, am opposed to this, uh, these, this series of uh, bills taken as a whole. These bills, uh, I think, are the wrong way to go. In fact, I have consistently supported the opposite direction. Uh, I've supported, as have colleagues on this call and, and throughout the, the General Assembly, uh, uh, largely on our side of the aisle, uh, I've supported repeal or, um, or reform of the whole 830G concept because I do believe in local control. And I think that the state shouldn't be mandating this. And we certainly shouldn't be going in the opposite direction, the way this uh, series of bills taken as a whole would, would lead us. Uh, I think it's, it's clearly the wrong approach and definitely the wrong approach, you know, in these uncertain economic times. So um, I look forward to a very informative discussion. And thanks again for letting me say hello. Thank you, Representative. And finally, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Rosa Rabindas. Thank you, Representative Zulu. And again, I also want to echo what my colleagues have already said. I want to thank you and Senator uh, Wong, as well as the staff for putting this together. This is such an important issue. And I think that bringing it to the people and bringing it to the local level, I think is so important because in fact, it does impact um, us locally here. I think many times people believe that the work that we do up at the state level um, has very little impact locally, but it's contrary to, to that belief because truly everything is local. Um, as you indicated, I'm a state representative, Rosa Rabimbis. I have the distinct honor of representing the borough of Naugatuck. And I can say that for Naugatuck specifically, we have a lot of plans in the works um, and we've got some very amazing individuals who serve voluntarily on a lot of our local boards and commissions. Um, and I think it's very important that we maintain local control. Uh, certainly, you know, for many towns, we've already have thoughts and ideas and plans and people vested. Um, not only financially, but emotionally as to the design and look um, that they would want for their town. So I think it's important. Um, certainly there should always be many facets of involvement. Um, no one town can do anything alone. Um, we should be looking to our neighboring towns. Uh, certainly we talk a lot about the ra our rail system and that's something that certainly spans you know, beyond one town alone. So these issues truly should be an open forum. Um, and I think you know, that's why I'm so impressed with the ability to put this on, reaching people early on before decisions are made at the state level. But truly the proposals that are before us is limiting, um, if not completely eliminating 
the ability for local control and local voices. And I think that's where we have to take a serious pause um, and make sure that there's not unintended consequences for, you know, good intentions on these proposals. So uh, certainly look forward to hearing from everyone and I appreciate everyone who's taking the time to be able to watch this now or watch it later, but it is certainly important for everyone to know what is taking place on the state level and how it impacts everyone. So again, thank you so much Representative Zulo and Wong for putting this together. Thank you, Representative Rabindus. And uh, without wasting any further time, I'm gonna ask our wonderful staff, which includes Sarah Clark tonight. So a special thank you to Sarah for helping uh, us navigate the tech world and put this on. I'm gonna ask Sarah if she could queue up the very short PowerPoint we have so that we can get started. And I will wait to see that. Perfect. I gotta tell you, the, the, the tech world is truly amazing. Look how fast that happened. A year ago, we would never have dreamed of something like this. And now here we are and uh, it's getting done. So the first uh, item that I, or piece of legislation that I'd like to discuss is Senate Bill 1024, which was um, uh, the product of the desegregate CT um, issue advocacy, advocacy program. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanna talk very quickly about the current affordable housing landscape. In Connecticut, we have a, uh, a statutory scheme which is uh, largely regulated, uh, laid out in 8-30, and specifically 8-30G, which um, through which uh, annually, the Department of Housing publishes a list of towns that meet the mandated goal of 10% affordable housing. If a town is not at a 10% affordable housing stock, the town is subject to a special appeals procedure through which developers or people who seek to bring affordable housing can appeal adversary decisions at local, uh, at local zoning boards and commissions and through which towns bear the burden to show that if they deny an application, that it has to um, be because of substantial public health and safety concerns. Uh, the deference given to affordable housing applications under 8-30G is, is very great. And the vast majority of appeals under 8-30G are sustained in favor of the applicants, meaning that towns are generally required to approve these plans because of the substantial interest in promoting affordable housing. And so if you live in a community or if you represent a community that is not at this 10% um, affordable housing threshold, you already have an element of state mandated top-down control via the existing 8-30G framework. Now, what is happening in this legislative session is that there are a series of proposals uh, that seek to expand that top-down approach to zoning in, in a number of ways. The first of those proposals is the Senate Bill 10-24. Uh, uh, as originally introduced, it did a number of things. Uh, and it was introduced via the Planning and Development Commission, which uh, on which I am the ranking member along with Senator Tony Wong. Uh, that proposal originally uh, sought to remove the word character as a consideration uh, in zoning proposals and instead substitute physical site characteristics in architectural context. Uh, more importantly, it originally sought to require uh, that towns without public hearing allow as of right, multifamily housing within a half mile of any transit station or of a transit station in your, commu in your community and within a quarter mile of a main street corridor. Now, importantly, during the public hearing process, there were a number of people, hundreds of people who came out to testify, admittedly in favor of and against the proposal. Eventually, when it came through the planning and development uh, JF meeting, the final meeting, the uh, provisions regarding the transit-oriented development, that half mile within a transit district, the multifamily housing, and the uh, multifamily within a, a quarter mile of Main Street, uh, they were removed from the legislation. And so in the proposal which came out of the committee, those, uh, those provisions are not in this piece of legislation. However, uh, we continue to receive emails, and I personally continue to receive phone calls uh, from people who are very concerned about provisions which, which still remain. 
um, specifically uh, section, there's a section which requires towns, uh, which says that towns cannot impose any different development conditions on manufactured homes, mobile homes, or mobile home parks than fit single family homes. There's a provision which allows towns to extinguish pre-existing non-conforming uses in residential zones after a public hearing and after a reasonable amount of time. So if you're a business in a residential zone and a town decides that that's no longer a, a use which is compatible with the zone, uh, while that's currently acknowledged as a pre-existing non-conforming constitutionally protected use, this legislation would essentially allow towns after public hearing an amount and a certain amount of time to extinguish that use. It establishes a, uh, it prevents towns from establishing any minimum floor area uh, greater than that which is specified in the public health code. And despite a diligent and exhaustive search, I'm unable to, uh, to find any such minimum floor area in the public health code. Uh, and it uh, requires parking capacity. It sets parking capacity limits, which are greatly less than which are required under many towns zoning regulations. And so, uh, in just those sections alone, you can see that for a lot of towns, uh, this one size fits all approach just simply would not work. There are towns where parking is a great issue. I'm sure you're all tuning in, listening, and especially legislators right now saying, geez, I can think of Main Street corridors. I can think of areas in town where, you know, requiring, uh, you know, two spaces for a two bedroom or more house or a two bedroom or more multifamily could turn into a real nightmare given the width of some of your streets and the congestion in some areas. Um, there's also an additional provision in this section that uh, requires ADUs, uh, essentially what are colloquially uh, referred to as in-law apartments as of right on any single family home lot in your community. So if you're a single, if you're zoned single family and you meet the, the, the general bulk standards, you will be allowed to have an ADU or a, an in-law apartment. Uh, most, uh, another key issue of this legislation is that um, it increases from 5,000 to 7,500 gallons the capacity for community sewers, community sewerage systems, which are under Department of Public Health, Health and not deep review. Deep is our environmental environmental arm in the state of Connecticut, and it possesses the capacity and the working knowledge to review the, the important environmental considerations that are associated with a lot of proposals, especially community sewerage systems. And what this does is it places under the Department of Public Health control and review those sewerage systems, which no knock to Department of Public Health. We have incredibly talented and, and, and great people in that department, but there are significant concerns about their ability to review uh, these proposals with the same scrutiny and the same level of technical expertise as our friends over at D. And so again, you can see that through 1024, there is a, there is a significant amount of top-down, one-size-fits-all, uh, uh, approach to, to zoning, which, which certainly may not work in a number of municipalities. And then if we can move on to House Bill 6611, this is the fair share uh, open communities bill. It is the House Majority Leader's uh, proposal or one that which is, which is advocated for by the House Majority Leader. And uh, it includes a formula driven approach to housing. What will happen under this proposal is that the Secretary of OPM, the Office of Policy and Management, for each planning region in our state will determine the municipal fair share base um, in each region and in each community. And what's interesting about this proposal is that your fair share of affordable housing is not based necessarily on the available open space in your community, the vacant land, uh, the infrastructure, and other capacities for additional development. What it's based on is the rateable real and personal property on your equalized net grand list, the median, inc uh, median income differences among all the towns in your planning region, according to US census data, uh, the percentage of your town's population before the poverty threshold, and the percentage of your town's population living in multifamily housing. And so it truly is an income-based approach to uh, distributing a, a affordable housing need as opposed to necessarily the capacity of your community to actually accommodate more housing in a responsible, eco-friendly manner. Um, under these proposals, certain percentages of the units have to be affordable, restricted for extremely low income households, only a certain percentage could be age restricted, and a substantial percentage, 40% of rental units must contain at least two or more bedrooms. 
Uh, the particularly scary part of this piece of legislation is that it creates, it, it stands to substantially increase the size of Connecticut's land use docket because in order to um, comply with this proposal, towns must publish uh, and develop and publish and submit to the Office of Policy Management uh, fair share housing plans, which uh, purport to um, establish how they will meet the 10% affordable housing threshold, or, or I'm sorry, the fair share housing uh, threshold set by the Office of Policy and Management. And if a town believes that it's in compliance with that statute, it has to file an action on the land use docket and then the court has to decide whether or not the fair share plan meets all the requirements set out in the statute. At any time, uh, certain parties, certain adversary parties or other parties, intervening parties can intervene in that, in that, um, in, in those, in those lawsuits and object to the town's plans, um, which could be incredibly burdensome. What I've said from the start is that this essentially creates a consent decree framework for every municipality in the state which fails to comply with the fair share mandates that OPM sets out. Now, even more of concern is that if you are an aggrieved party under the statutes, so for example, if, if you're in a community where the fair share threshold has not been met and your application is denied, or you're a nonprofit advocacy group who uh, is unhappy that a municipality has failed to meet its fair share quota, uh, you can bring a lawsuit against the town to seek any number of remedial measures from the court in order to force the town to further fine tune its fair share plan or to make the town comply with uh, OPM's fair share mandates. And what's of great concern in this legislation is that under this proposal, if an aggrieved party does that and they are successful, the town, the municip municipality is responsible for that aggrieved party's attorney's fees, in addition to their own attorney's fees for having to defend the legis to have to defend these lawsuits. What I think is that, or what I've always said is that this essentially turns towns into cash pinatas. And towns like, uh, there are a number of towns across our state, especially very small towns that don't have land use lawsuits for years, three, five, seven years at a time, who will be hauled into our courts to answer to these top-down state mandates for low, that, that seek to impose on local control and impose OPM standards of what they believe uh, zoning is supposed to do across our state. Uh, this legislation is, is particularly of concern. Um, and the reason I'll, before I move on that I'll say, well, actually I should stop and say, do any of the legislators who are here right now have any questions? Because I know this is a lot to take in. I don't see any hands raised. I'm not that great at Zoom. So I'll so, just- So uh, yeah, Representative Zillow, because I'm gonna have to jump off in a couple of minutes. So I think, you know, um, the biggest issue with this, this legislation that I'm hearing about is this whole local control piece that, and I, you know, I know that, I know that we'll, we'll talk more about that. We'll talk perhaps, uh, you know, and I'm not an attorney. I know there's, I think I'm surrounded by them right now on my Zoom screen, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but, you know, when I look at what has historically, and I don't want to get all philosophical because I don't want to waste waste the time of, of people listening, but listening. But you know, when I look at what makes Connecticut so great, and whether it's our our, our urban centers or the smallest towns, and I have a couple of those really small towns in my district, um, is the fact that we we have we have kept to that kind of that Yankee way of thinking and that Yankee ingenuity that. If we have a town and we have a government elected in its own right, uh, and we have the rules and the regulations of that town, that they should be allowed to govern, and to to not have to have the, um, the the state come down and have us come down from Hartford and with the, you know, with a, a ruling or a mandate from under the gold dome and take away that control. And part of what makes Connecticut so great, and part of what provides so much character to our towns, is the fact that they are all unique, are are all unique in their own way. So. I don't know if we can spend some time talking about about how this, I guess how that how this interferes with with local rule and local government versus um, uh, what this bill will do, you know, and, and and how it's going to change that, and why you know so many people have commented on that this is it's unconstitutional. It's a whole bunch of whole bunch of things that that are not in 
you know, in my wheelhouse necessary to speak to. So as again, I'm not an attorney, but um, I don't know if we can talk a little bit about, about that and the effect and, and actually, and I, and I guess we, what we're all concerned about is what the effect would be that now you could potentially have uh, some other governing body telling you what to do for something that's as, as uh, critical as zoning and you know, zoning helps to identify character of towns and, and is done for certain reasons. You know, I have a lot of open space in, in, uh, in my district, lots and lots of open space that um, people are very concerned about. So I, I gave you a lot, I'm sorry, I, I probably uh, should stop talking. No, 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 I think you really hit the nail right on the head. You know, the part of the problem with this legislative framework and these proposals is that they are top down, which infringes on municipalities, uh, you know, rights to local control, but more so it's that one size fits all approach. And that's what we hear most is that zoning can never be one size fits all because what works for a very small rural community won't work for a suburban community, which won't work for a large suburban community, which won't work for a small city, which won't work for a big city. We all have different zoning interests because of the nature of our communities. Mm. And there are a lot of people who make a case that zoning should be hyper-local, literally right down to the neighborhood and street. Uh, you know, there are some towns where they've had uh, certain intersections where they wanted to pervert, preserve certain traffic patterns or, or, or certain other uses. And you know, you go before zoning commissions and you, you enact these frameworks to preserve those those interests. And you know, so much of zoning has a lot to do with your brand list as well. I mean, different towns have different brand lists, um, you know, economic development goals. And what they do in making those local decisions ha has a very important impact on how on the, the tax course and the budget courses that they chart for their community. So I think you're absolutely right that it, it, it comes down to an issue of local control, you know, that one size fits all approach doesn't work. Um, and that continues to be the concern we hear. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I appreciate the, the further clarification on that with respect to the one size fits all approach because it doesn't, doesn't work. And for all of the reasons you stated, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, honored and privileged to represent the town of Bethlehem as one of the 10 towns in my district. And they don't have, uh, they don't have zoning regulations as uh, they're one of two towns of Connecticut. They, they, they have to comply with things like wetlands uh, restrictions and, and rules, but, um, but they, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation there. They sometimes run into problems with that because of, uh, because of it, but, but they work it out. And I think that's part of the, the, the larger issue as well, is that when we take away that local control, we're going to, uh, the, the, the towns and cities will, will ultimately lose some of the ability to work things out. And I think that's wrong on a lot of fronts. So thank you for that. I appreciate that, Representative. No, thank you. And, and thank you for being here and offering your, uh, offering your perspective. I know you bring a lot of experience to, uh, to, the, to the debate. And I know that uh, you're going to be working very hard up in our Senate as we these, these measures make it through the legislative process. Yeah, so thank, thank you for your input. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I'm going to have to take my leave, unfortunately. But Hopefully, Senator Huang will be back to represent the, uh, the Senate Republicans uh, at some point. But, uh, but thank you. For those of you that are out listening out on Facebook, uh, obviously, you can always reach out to my office as well with any other additional comments or concerns that you have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I'm still a little bit new to this, this Zoom world. Are we still up on the screen with our presentation? And if not, can we be back on the screen with it? I'm going to wait a second to hear or see. And we are now back on the screen. This is great. This is kind of like hosting a game show where you get to call the shots. This is really great. So we, we, we just went through 6611, House Bill 6611. So I'd like to move on to House Bill 6107. Um, what I'm going to say is that a lot of these topics are, are wonky intellectual topics. You know, um, when, when you get down into the real, you know, meat of zoning regulations, there, there aren't a lot of people who care necessarily about uh, reorganization of our zoning act to address soil erosion or sediment control or uh, public service and ground drinking water. These aren't the things that necessarily keep people up at night. There are many people who are concerned about them, and I, I certainly share their concerns, but a lot of people reach out to me when there's a controversial proposal in their backyard or in their community. And what I try to stress to people is that 
the regulations we're talking about tonight are going to have a direct effect on the types of developments that you see in your backyard, that you see down the street from you, and that you see in your community. And the House Bill 6107 is exactly the type of bill that is going to have that effect. What this bill does is that it reorganizations the current zoning enabling act, the current zoning framework. And it does a lot of what uh, Senate Bill 1024 does. Uh, so I'll try not to repeat very much, but in section one, it requires that zoning regulations affirmatively further the purposes of federal fair housing. It removes character um, as a, as a um, something that may be considered by uh, local zoning commissions, but does not include objective physical and architectural characteristics as a substitute. Uh, it provides for cluster development. It imposes uh, certain conditions on manufactured homes. Again, that uh, they cannot be treated differently than um, single family homes. Same thing for mobile parks. Uh, it requires uh, that towns develop um, plans to reach their 10% affordable housing thresholds, but it does allow them to combine them with, with their um, plans of conservation and development, which is a bonus. But uh, critically in section three, it requires OPM, the Office of Policy Management, to convene a working group to develop and recommend compliance with the requirements of 8-30G, our current affordable housing framework. The concerning part of this proposal is that a lot of people say that it's putting the cart before the horse. We have um, 6611, which is that fair share needs assessment that I just discussed, which essentially seeks to completely um, revamp our affordable housing framework. But then in 6107, we seek to study how we can encourage further compliance with 8-30G. So a lot of people feel like we're putting the cart before the horse uh, by trying to propose something like fair share before we really study affordable housing and know what we can do to actually increase the stock of affordable housing meaningfully across our state. Another concern that we hear from people is that there is absolutely no municipal representation on this working group. There are no municipal CEOs or no spots for municipal CEOs, which is, a, a potential real drawback because you know municipal CEOs know their communities the best. They're able to offer such an incredible working knowledge of how zoning regulations really affect communities and the types of developments they see. And by not giving municipal CEOs a voice uh, in, in this working group, you're really leaving out a key uh, stakeholder. And so that's something that we'll be seeking to uh, to have addressed as this legislation moves forward. So what is our next? bill on this slide. Perfect, Senate Bill 172. So in addition to the three bills that we that, that I've discussed so far, there are a number of bills which uh, did not uh, make it out of their respective committees, but which still remain concerns as far as legislation moving forward. Um, one of the, or a series of proposals, including Senate Bill 172 this year, sought to impose penalties on municipalities that did not meet the current affordable housing threshold, the 10% housing, uh, housing stock threshold. One of those bills was Senate Bill 172. Another was Senate Bill 1068. In Senate Bill 172, there would be a, a, a tax of anywhere between one and two mills on any residential or commercial property in a community that did not meet the 10% affordable housing stock goal in 8-30G. That was in finance. Senate Bill 1068 sought to impose a, a mill tax anywhere between two mills and four tenths of a mill, but only on residential homes in towns not meeting that 10% affordable housing stock goal. So you can see some of the issue with, uh, issue with this dynamic, this interrelation between all this legislation, because you have uh, Senate Bill 1024 is seeking to increase the amount of multifamily housing, not necessarily affordable housing, but multifamily housing. You have uh, the fair share needs assessment seeking to increase housing stock in communities. But then you have uh, Senate Bill 172 and 1068, which if you still don't meet that 10% affordable housing stock goal under our current legislation, your community would be penalized, uh, which is an alarming thought uh, especially when you look at some towns, uh, Madison, Guilford, we had just done a presentation for those towns where a substantial amount of homes and businesses in those communities were going to be uh, hit with this one to two mill tax. And we heard a lot of concern, especially as we uh, 
see to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and the devastating economic effects of that pandemic that, that you know, business owners and homeowners just simply could not afford another tax. Uh, you know, families are looking to rebuild savings. A lot of people are still, you know, on unemployment seeking to recover. And this type, this type of legislation would be really harmful to those individuals and those businesses. What is our next slide? So uh, Senate Bill 1066 and House Bill 6638 are what are called placeholder bills. Uh, they're colloquially uh, also termed dummy bills uh, by those who are legislators. And uh, they're included in this PowerPoint to emphasize the fact that they can at any time serve as vessels for the inclusion or reintroduction of zoning language that may have appeared in bills that necessarily didn't make it out of committee or zoning bills that got public hearings and didn't make it out of committee or even as uh, aircraft carrier bills. In other words, bills that seek to encompass any number of the provisions that I've discussed tonight. Um, they're included here as a, well, again, as a warning that we could see these proposals pop up in any context. I see a hand from Representative Labriola. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Joe. I would like to uh, speak on behalf of people who are watching and thinking, um, are you kidding me? Um, because I'm sort of jumping out of my chair, jumping through the screen when you think about taking together what kind of radical changes would happen to our communities if these bills were to pass as, as a whole, even part of them. Um, it, it, as, as people who are watching have already figured out, um, these are terrible, terrible bills, which uh, constitute a, a, a very, very bad uh, public policy. Uh, you know, it, it, taken as a whole. Um, I, I just thought I would uh, address what I see are some of the questions just quickly. You know, what are the chances of this, these things passing? I got to believe that they're not going to all pass. Hopefully none of them will pass. It, it seems like there'll be enough opposition that there'll be enough uh, right thinking legislators to, to block this, but we're not going to take it to chance. We're not going to leave it to chance. We on this call, we on this this Zoom, uh, this Facebook Live presentation, we will be opposing it. Uh, we will be opposing it in the House. We will be opposing it in the Senate uh, with everything we have. And I, I'm sure our leadership uh, would agree with that. And, and my colleagues on this uh, panel right now would agree with that. With all the delaying tactics and, and uh, any other tactic that we can come up with to, to defeat these bills, we're going to, going to employ. And then finally, I think there was a specific question Sounds like it might have been somebody from my town committee because I got, I think, an identical question when I was last at my town committee meeting uh, as to, you know, well, would we file some amendments to make it better, make these bills better? And, I, you know, I've been up there for a while and, you know, typically the, the majority party would, would, you know, do a kitchen sink approach and they'd put everything that they could think of figuring that, well, you know, we, here's 100 percent, but if we only get 70 percent, at least we get what we want. And, you know, that might make sense. Uh, as a strategy, but not in this case. I don't think 70% of this is gonna be a good thing at all. I mean, with the possible exception of maybe make everything go into a study, do nothing except study it further. Now that might be the type of amendment that would make sense because it would really just put the brakes on everything or maybe make everything permissive, meaning none of it is required. It's all just allowed. The municipalities may do these things, but not must do these things. So short of an amendment like that, I would be opposed to trying to, you know, amend this, amend this series of bills to make them better because it's all bad. And 70% of bad is just as, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing great, nothing to celebrate. So I do think uh, this is, you know, uh, going to be a real battle. I, you know, if we represent you, then we're already with you. But if you are living in a community with uh, other legislators, uh, contact them, reach out to them, send them an email, call them, make your thoughts known, because this is the time. The time is now for us to oppose this. Thanks. I appreciate hearing that. And I appreciate your focus on, on the study aspect, because one of the questions that I've continually raised is, is there any empirical evidence, any real evidence to, to show that these measures will actually create more affordable housing? And the answer that I continue to get is that no, there is no such empirical evidence. 
there is evidence or at least good reason to believe that it will increase housing stock, that it will increase the amount of housing we have. There is increase, there is evidence to say that it will increase income diversity, but not necessarily the amount of affordable housing that we have. And so one of the largest issues that I have is that I can't believe that we are, again, we're putting the cart before the horse by saying, we're gonna enact these measures blindly without really knowing what their effects will be. We're gonna impose these mandates on municipalities and force them co to comply, haul them into court and then make them pay their aggrieved parties le you know, legal fees to comply with these, the, these provisions when we don't really know what the practical effects would be. And for that reason, I continue to agree with you. We continue to need to study this issue more. It's such an issue of import for local municipalities and their futures that we can't just haphazardly enact it. I saw that Representative Paletta had his hand raised, followed by Representative Bendis. Go ahead, Rep. Paletta. Uh, thank you, Joe. And I just wanted to chime in on that question that said, what is the likelihood that this, these bills will pass or that this bill will pass? Well, I, I want to say that the numbers are the numbers. You know, um, the Republicans, unfortunately, um, do not have the majority in either chamber. And of course, as you know, we do not control the governor's seat. But that doesn't mean that we can't lead from behind. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. The Noel Tolls, Connecticut, um, with very limited numbers in the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, worked behind the scenes to rally people up and uh, the Democrats actually pulled the bill and did not have enough votes to call that bill last year. Um, that was perhaps the biggest um, defeat of this current administration. Governor Lamont's cornerstone when he ran was on some form of tolling. And that all just perished when the no tolls people got loud around the state of Connecticut. They held rallies, they held forums. We had, um, uh, Representative Laura Devlin, Senator Henry Martin holding person-to-person uh, uh, -person forums in just about every town in Connecticut, and it worked. So we need to take that same approach with this bill, and it will work. If enough people get loud, um, there, is enough, there are enough legislators in smaller towns like mine, like Representative Zulos and others, um, that are worried about this bill that would be hesitant to vote for this bill. But if they don't hear from people, this bill will sail through. And that is my fear. So we do have an opportunity to defeat it or water it down. Um, I agree with what Representative Labriola said, 70% of bad is still bad. Um, so there's absolutely no reason why we should pass this bill in any way, shape or form. If we wanna turn it into a study, maybe that's an idea to pump the brakes for three or four years. Um, but we still need to put an end to this idea that we're going to lose our local control of zoning. The only way we're going to do that is to lead from behind. And the way we do that is to contact legislators, hold rallies, hold forums in just about every town, and make sure we let the majority of the members of the House and the Senate know that if you vote for this piece of legislation, then in 2022, you are gonna be in trouble for your reelection. And at the end of the, the day, uh, most politicians are very concerned about the election in front of them. So if they hear from enough constituents that this bill, this bill is bad, they're gonna be telling the leadership, don't put me on the spot in an election year. So let's, uh, let's keep it going where we tell, um, you know, our community leaders and our folks, reach out to your legislators, let them know that this is a bad bill and it should not be called um, ever, but definitely not in the next four weeks. Thank you. I'm sorry, I probably went over my time. <laughs> there are no time limits here, but I, I will echo your sentiment that people always ask me, what's the most important, what's the best thing we could do to, uh, you know, to oppose this legislation? And it's, you know, get in touch with your legislator, find out who your legislator is and be vocal. Let them know where you stand because in the absence of hearing from you, they will assume that you have no opposition. And, and that's actually a very dangerous uh, proposition. Representative Bendis. Thank you, Representative Zulo. Um, once again, thank you for doing this. And I think you said it perfectly in the sense of people really do need to reach out to your legislators, your senator, your representative, but also straight up to the governor's office in that regard. It's so very important because we do hear often up there, 
well, we, you know, they haven't heard from their constituents, therefore they must be okay with something. And quite frankly, they have to remember, they're up there to inform their constituents and speak on behalf of their constituents, many of which are working, have families, have other things in their lives that they may not have that time to reach out. Um, but that's why I think, you know, certainly this is this forum is being put on by Republicans. Um, and we are the minority in the state of Connecticut, but facts are empowering. So I truly believe in providing facts over fiction. So going to the people as the Representative Valletta had um, informed even regarding tolls, for example, just telling the truth about what's in these proposals is so important. I've had people come up to me and say, hey, listen, what's, what's the deal with these proposals? Isn't everyone for affordable housing? Isn't everyone for desegregating Connecticut? And everyone I've spoken to, elected and non-elected, agree. We are all for affordable housing. We are all for desegregating Connecticut. The problem with these proposals is it actually does not do that, unfortunately. Um, and that's where the devil are in the details. And we truly need to then, you know, unwrap it and show the proposals for what they are. This is giving up completely local control. I mean, just think about it. You're going to have OPM working group coming down to your town telling you what, was, what would work and what doesn't work. The people who know the town are the people who live in the town. We should be comforted that in the state of Connecticut, as small as we are, we're very diverse in a variety of different ways. So if someone wants to a nice, quiet town feel, we've got that option in Connecticut. If someone wants the hustle and bustle of being in a city and having everything convenient and not even having to purchase a vehicle, we have that option too. Um, but to literally say one size fits all and everyone has to do the same exact thing throughout the state of Connecticut is just wrong on so many other so many levels. Um, the other thing I also want to point out is many times people hear about different uh, sections of these proposals and say, well, you know, we're doing that now. Um, I'll speak for the borough of Naugatuck. We have great, amazing plans uh, in the works. A, a, around development, around our transit, uh, a rail line up and down uh, the valley here. And many of us absolutely support that. We want that. It's going to be financially a big boom, I hope and anticipate, not only for the borough of Naugatuck, but the whole valley area. But at the same time, we want to do it in a way that we can control it. So as you're riding in that train to work, to entertainment, and you want to look out the window and just not continuously see high rises, we should have the ability to do that. We have a lot of open space and nature along our rail system. If we want to designate a specific spot and say, we don't want to develop here, we want to keep it open space, we should have the ability to do so. Again, you know, the local, all issues are local. We should be empowering our local leaders to do exactly what we believe is best, not only for the towns financially, but also the characteristic of the towns. So it's very important. And so the other thing I want to highlight is when people say, well, then, you know, what's wrong with the system we have? In fact, there really isn't much that's wrong with it. And maybe we should be examining what we have and improving what we have. Um, right now, we do have incentives for development. So the state will provide financial incentives for specific types of developments. And we're very fortunate, speaking again, the Valley general area, we have a lot of brownfields and old manufacturing buildings. So when we have the ability to knock those down and redevelop, that's a huge financial incentive, not only for the local municipality, but for the state as a whole. So there are financial incentives and programs the state provides now, and again, for affordable housing. So people need to inform themselves, take more advantage of that, maybe even tweak the programs we have. But to completely scrap that, or even to modify it, and giving up complete control for somebody else's plan for the state of Connecticut just is not right. You know, I, I can't agree with you more as far as zoning being local and needing to empower municipalities and leveraging the kinds of programs we have now to do that. Um, I'll mention this 
and then try to conclude as quickly as possible because I like to keep these under an hour. Um, we have great programs in Connecticut right now that assist developers in creating affordable housing. We have low income housing tax credit programs. We have flex funds. We have a number of funds through Department of Housing and CHAFA, Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, that developers can use to create affordable and lower income housing. The, problems with, the problem with those programs, and it's not really a problem, but it's a drawback, is that so often it's only larger developers who can leverage those programs, who can participate in those programs. And so one of the counter proposals, which I have made to leadership and to other colleagues in the House and Senate, is that as part of these, um, whatever framework that we seek to enact, if there is one that gets enacted, is that we seek to partner with the Department of Housing and Connecticut Housing Finance Authority to make funds under those programs available to people who perform renovations of single family homes, multifamily homes up to four units, who wanna create duplexes, triplexes, you know, in middle housing, because it's not necessarily the large corporate developer that we have to help out. We certainly do, but we also have to be empowering our small developers, our, our minority owned businesses, our women owned businesses, uh, the, the people, uh, the types of businesses that we have in our communities that we want building in communities and our, our communities and enriching our communities. And so I think if we make a significant portion of those funds available to those developers and then allow certain types of housing in certain areas of our town based on local input, local control and local decision, we have a real winning formula. We have a formula where businesses are going to succeed because they're going to have some state help. Towns are going to succeed because they have input in the decisions. And the state's going to succeed because we're actually going to meaningfully generate new affordable housing. So I think that's a solution that we need to continue to explore. And I think it's directly in the same vein as what you've just discussed. Um, before we conclude, I'll offer any of the legislators who are still on the opportunity to offer any parting remarks, remarks or any perspective. I love that, that's a great sign. You never get a, a group of legislators all in one place who we'll all say, no, we've had it. We don't want to speak. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so once again, uh, before I conclude, I do uh, want to emphasize and say that tonight we, we did miss one person, Senator, Senator Tony Wong, who could not manage to get on in time. And I will say that he really does bring a, a breadth, a breadth and, and a depth of understanding of these issues and a real flavor for issue, ad, issue advocacy for this, for this topic. He is a zealous advocate for local control. And we did miss his perspective tonight. And I do wanna uh, recognize that because he continues um, to advocate uh, you know, for counter proposals to some of the proposals we've seen tonight. I also wanna thank uh, Sarah Clark who, who helped organize this, our tech, uh, Representative Coletta, uh, Senator Berthel, Rep Harrison, Rep Labriola, Rep Rabindus, and Rep Demilio. I know he couldn't make it again though for their input prior to this and for their participation tonight. You know, these are the re uh, representatives who are advocating uh, for their uh, for their communities. Uh, they continue to do a great job. It's great to have had all of you on. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to have done this tonight. Look forward to doing more. And so in the absence of anything else, I will say good night and uh, thank you again. Thank you. And thank you to all the viewers. <laughs>